Jensen is crazy, it is said, because he believes that he is Jesus Christ. Behind this cartoon conception is a more complicated cosmology than has been previously understood. And then you see Jesus and you see Christ as being a little God, partner. Because I had the altars of the Druids long before the cross came. And the altars of the Druids will be there long after the cross is gone. Whether the Christians like to accept it or not, he did what I was saying. The cross came by and passed by my window and I seen it go by and I said, Ah, oh, Christ was a little God. Because that was where they hung that fucking last asshole. What do you think about that last asshole? He was, he's still there. And you see him? He's still right there. Nothing's changed. It's right now, down then, as it's right now, now. You dig? And I'm not going back over there. Fuck them assholes. Manson's use of Christian terminology may have been inspired by a man who once walked a similar path. Francis Penovic was a burglar, con man, and petty criminal who had spent much time in prison before he changed his name to Krishna Venta in 1948 and announced that he was the Christ Everlasting. In the 50s, Krishna Venta built his Fountain of the World commune in the Santa Susana Mountains, not far from the Spahn Ranch where Manson and his family would settle over a decade later. Like Manson, Krishna Vinta's following consisted mostly of young female disciples. They were given different colors according to their temperament and aptitudes, much like Charlie's rainbow. Krishna Vinta was killed in 1958 in a dynamite blast ignited by a jealous husband who disapproved of the guru's sexual teachings. But his legend lingered in the area to inspire Manson to attempt to take over the cult years later. Atop this skull-like rock formation at Fountain of the World, Manson held crucifixion rituals that culminated in family orgies. At one time during his Hollywood period, Manson was hired as technical advisor for a Universal Studios film project concerning the second coming of Christ. When Charlie learned that the producers intended to portray Christ as black, he abandoned the project. You see, now, every time I come down off of this, you don't like me. Then I'm a no good son of a bitch, because then I put a piece of steel right there on my leg, and I sure not can cut anything with any place I want to cut it. And I live within the sphere of me. I don't push it off on nobody else. You take the most holy man they got, you dig, and treat him as worse as they can. Degradate him, drag him through all kinds of shit, spit on him, cuss him, just do everything and then turn around and go to church and worship him on Sunday and think you're going to get away with it. Don't work that way. For all of Manson's identification as man's son, the son of man, the archetypal figure of the hanged man or the slain king, he is perhaps more commonly identified with the opposite force in nature. You know, I mean, they, they preach it, but they don't believe it. I believe it. I don't preach it, but I know it. It's a reality. It's a reality. Jesus Christ is a reality. And so is that other guy. The dark allure of Satanism and the mystique of the vampire link Sharon Tate and Susan Atkins in a web of mystery. They seem bound together by destiny, protagonists in a drama decreed by fate. There are parallels in their lives that defy logic. In 1967, Susan Atkins was an aspiring actress making her living as a stripper in San Francisco's North Beach. Strangely enough, she worked under the pseudonym of Sharon King. 
She was hired by Anton Zandor LeBay, the high priest of the Church of Satan, to play the part of a vampire in a topless witch's review held at a San Francisco nightclub. Atkins had written of this performance. I was the perfect sexy vampire, ready for my casket lying at the center of the stage. I knew I'd never be able to get into that casket for real without getting stoned. I popped the acid tab into my mouth. I had shaken several people when I had risen from the casket and pointed a long, blood-red fingernail at the audience and marked them as my next victims. The same year that Susan Atkins made her debut as a vampire, Sharon Tate was cast by her husband-to-be, Roman Polanski, as a vampire's victim in his film, The Dance of the Vampires. In the film, Tate's character is referred to as a sacrifice to Lucifer. Earlier in her career, Sharon Tate had played a witch in the British film, The Eye of the Devil, or Thirteen. During this film, Tate began a brief period of dabbling with white witchcraft. She was initiated into the coven of Alex Sanders, self-proclaimed king of the witches, by high priestess Maxine Sanders. The ritual was held in Tate's dressing room trailer on the set of the film. If Sharon Tate was fascinated with the more benign aspects of the occult, Susan Atkins held a similar short-lived dalliance with black magic. Here she is seen in the ritual chamber of the Church of Satan with founder LeBay. Perhaps it was inevitable that Sharon Tate and Susan Atkins, both dilettantes in the opposite extremes of occultism, would finally meet in 1969. It is alleged that Susan Atkins licked the blood of Sharon Tate off her fingers that night before leaving something witchy on the wall, reenacting their previous roles as vampire and vampire's victim. At the approximate time of Sharon Tate's murder, 12.30 a.m., the TV guide for August 8, 69, reveals that a film entitled The Vampire's Ghost was broadcast over the airwaves. There are other oblique links between Anton LaVey's Church of Satan and the Manson phenomenon. On the very night of the Tate murders, Anton LaVey performed a rite in the same ritual chamber where Susan Atkins had once posed. This ritual was entitled The Riding Forth, and its purpose, according to LaVey, a strict advocate of law and order who despised the 60s lifestyle 